Welcome to the National Arts Club NAC at Home program. My name is Angela Louie and I am happy to have you with us today. For those who are not familiar with the National Arts Club, we are a 501c3 nonprofit based in New York City with a mission to stimulate, foster, and promote public interest in the arts and to educate the American people in the fine arts. Annually, the club offers more than 150 free programs to the public, including exhibitions, theatrical and musical performances, lectures, and readings. For more information about the National Arts Club, you can visit us at nationalartsclub.org or find us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. If you wanna become a member of the National Arts Club, please email admissions at thenationalartsclub.org for more information. I'm so excited about today's talk on film noir fashion. We are so honored to have today's guest, Kimberly Truller. Here is a little about her. After more than 20 years of studying film and fashion history, Kimberly Truller is an author, guest speaker, and host of the screening series on the history of fashion in film. She has been an adjunct professor and expert for companies like Turner Classic Movies, BBC Worldwide, Christie's Auction House, and Elle Magazine, and was featured in CNN's 2019 docuseries, American Style. Her book, Film Nora Style, is available as an ebook today and as a physical book in December. Before Kimberly begins, I want to say that following the presentation will be a brief Q&A, so if you have any questions for Kimberly, you can type them into the chat box. Her latest book, Film Noir Style, The Killer 1940s, is available in two forms, as an ebook, which you can purchase today through the link provided in the chat box, and as a physical book that you can pre-order now, which will be shipped to you in December. Kimberly, we are so absolutely thrilled to have you. So, thank you so much. <laughs> thank you, thank you. So for this, for tonight's topic, film noir fashion, what a fascinating subject. How did the idea of writing this book come to you? Well, I've done a series on the history of fashion and film and taught it as a class. And so I do every single decade from the 20s to the 80s. And so the 40s, um, some of the most influential style of the 40s comes from film noir, which is pretty incredible considering that it these generally aren't a you know, great big productions. Um, and so when I had the chance to do my first book, film noir is a great, great love of mine. It's how I was first introduced to classic film. So it was kind of a no brainer. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the 20 films you selected to focus on. Of the many, many titles in this genre, how did you come to select these specific 20 films for your book? Well, there are some from the 40s that are just these essential film noir, something like the Maltese Falcon or Double Indemnity. There was no question that uh, movies like those needed to be on this list. And then there are others, as I mentioned, when I do um, my history of fashion and film, there are some of the most iconic costume design of all time from film noir. So movies like Gilda, for example. So I knew that those needed to be in there as well. And then there were a few, there were two that were kind of on the, are they noir or not fence. And I thought that there was value to including those two films, which I'll discuss today. And then, you know, I tried to keep a balance between each of the periods that I cover. Um, and so I just picked some of my favorites to fill in the blanks. <laughs> so that's amazing. And we are all ready to learn about film noir fashion. So Kimberly, could you tell us more about this, please? Yes, absolutely. Let's escape into the glamour of film noir, shall we? Yeah. 
so my book is film noir style the killer 1940s but it is also an online series that starts in october um, the difference between the book and the series, the book obviously has the opportunity to delve a lot deeper into the details of each of these films. It's, it's more than just film noir fashion, it is style. So I discuss the cinematographers and other artists that are part of these productions. And then the online series has a component where each of the movies I call the cinema connections. So we look at how these movies influenced fashion at the time they premiered and the ones that continue to influence fashion today. So you'll see a little bit of that in today's presentation. So let's look at the book by the numbers. One decade, the 1940s, it's divided into four chapters plus an introduction. We cover 13 different costume designers in this book, which is exciting because there's a few lesser known costume designers that I was really happy to put a spotlight on them. 20 films, as Angela said, 40 stars and their style, more than 250 photos. So even if you don't read the book, <laughs> you're going to get something that you are going to love to look at and it's 288 pages. So this is the layout of the book. Again, four parts plus the introduction and it's divided into periods of time because actually the 40s is a very interesting time with distinct parts to it. So there's before the war, 1940, 1941, the war years, 1942 to 45, the year of transition, 1946, which has its own identity, and then the post-war years, 47 to 50. So in the introduction to the book, of course, I'm looking at first the discussion of what is film noir. I call it a genre. Some people call it a movement, um, but as a genre, it's different than any other. So if you think of others like Westerns or musicals, it's very easy to categorize what movies fall into those genres. Whereas with film noir, like we were just discussing, there are some films that there is a debate that goes on. Are they film noir or are they not noir? So film noir is different in that it's even its term came about almost after the fact by French film critics. First, Nino Frank in August 1946. And they observed this darker mood in American cinema in the 1940s. And so from that point on, it was called film noir. The introduction also looks at some of the cinematic influences of film noir, what, what led up to film noir, and one of them is German Expressionism. And you can see from this selection of screenshots from the movies uh, how they influence the mood and the lighting of film noir. These films came from Germany's studio UFA from the, the 1920s into the early 1930s. And what's further significant about this is that many of the directors that worked at UFA emigrated to America and then became directors and also actors and cinematographers from UFA contributing to film noir in America. So in the book, we have a director like Robert Siodmak, who did The Killers. He came from UFA. Joseph von Sternberg, who's in the book for The Shanghai Gesture, he came from UFA. Michael Curtiz, who did Mildred Pierce and also the noir adjacent Casablanca, also from UFA. Even Alfred Hitchcock, who's British, spent time working at UFA and he's in the book for the movie Notorious. One of my favorite German expressionist films is Pandora's Box. Pandora's Box is one of the 50 most influential movies from a standpoint of style, period. But it is a great precursor to film noir, not the least of which because of Louise Brooks' character, Lulu, who is an intrigant. And in the world of film noir, there's kind of two big categories of women. 
femme fatales, which most women are, they're, they're called this, but they're not all fatal women. They're not all lethal women in film noir. There are also intrigants, women who intrigue. And I do a hat tip to my friend, Eddie Muller, who really came up with this distinction. And so Lulu is an intrigant, and intrigants can cause harm to the generally the men around them, but sometimes they don't do harm. Um, so I explore this category throughout the book. In America in the 1930s, the production code came about in response to the rather frank sexuality that was coming about and some of the violence. And some of the pre-code movies, which are the movies that came from 1930 to 1934, these are the years where the studios were still trying to get away with their old ways before the censorship really cracked down. So there's a number of pre-code movies that also influenced film noir. So pre-code horror like Dracula and Frankenstein, pre-code gangster films like Scarface and The Public Enemy, and the gangster pictures in particular because they had these lead characters that were anti-heroes. So the audience were often rooting for men and women who were on the wrong side of the law um, and who had, there was ambiguity in their moral code. So we see this with a lot of film noir characters. And then Joseph von Sternberg's great proto-noir, Shanghai Express. You can tell the mood of this for sure. But Marlena Dietrich, not only being a muse to Sternberg, was a model intrigant for those that would come in film noir. Most notably, uh, Lauren Bacall in To Have and Have Not and Elizabeth Scott in Dead Reckoning. So before the war, so each section begins with its own introduction, sort of the historical context of the time, which had a lot to do what, with what was happening in the world of noir on screen. During this period, much of the world was already at war. And so Americans were just sitting there saying, if and when. Uh, but America was already contributing to the support of the Allies during this time. So there was a lot of anxiety. And also, we're sort of like at the tail end of the 30s, even in 1940, 1941. And so women, women in the workforce, the two biggest areas that women worked were in domestic service and retail. And what was even surprising to me in doing research for this book is the roller coaster ride that women went on in the 1940s as far as their place in the workforce. It's really quite a journey. And again, it connects to how they were presented, women were presented in film noir. So for this time period, I'm looking at three films, Maltese Falcon, I Wake Up Screaming, and The Shanghai Gesture, which all came out in 1941. Maltese Falcon, you have to have it. Uh, there is no debate on whether this is noir or not. This is widely considered the first film noir. It's a giant. It is a pivot point for Humphrey Bogart as he steps into the leading man roles and his style becomes front and center style that came from his own closet, by the way. And Mary Astor right out of the gates as one of the worst femme fatales of all of film noir as Bridget O'Shaughnessy. Costumes by Ori Kelly, who was head of costume design at Warner Brothers. I Wake Up Screaming, a film noir from 20th Century Fox that came out right on the heels of the Maltese Falcon, but too few people know this movie. The cinematography alone is stunning and worth a watch. But of course, the costumes by Gwen Wakeling, who was then head of costume design at 20th Century Fox. She's by far one of the lesser known costume designers in this book, so it's fun to share a bit about her. And we have two women in this movie, Carol Landis 
and also Betty Grable, who's appearing in a serious picture that's very unlike her other more glitzy musicals. And the Shanghai Gesture. Now, I'm just going to give you a taste of what my online events are like so you can get a sense of what I share for each of the pictures. So this was directed by Joseph von Sternberg, two costume designers, Oleg Cassini and Royer. We only have time to talk about one of those costume designers today. So I'm choosing Oleg Cassini since he designed for the lead, Jean Tierney. And Cassini, like so many costume designers from the golden age of Hollywood, came from the world of couture. He studied fashion, worked for Jean Patou in Europe, and Cassini had his own couturier in Rome. When he came over to America, he worked at Paramount for a few years, and then he started hopscotching to different studios, and this was because he was being blackballed uh, because of his relationship with Jean Tierney. So all of that <laughs> is in the book. Uh, the Shanghai gesture. So this is one that people debate, is it noir or not? Some of the reason for this is because the setting. The setting seems much more like an art deco picture, which love to, to have settings in exotic locales. Von Sternberg in particular loved them. Morocco, Macau, Shanghai Express, the Shanghai gesture. This was what he loved to do. Uh, and then also, you know, some of the costumes really have more of a 1930s feel to them. Uh, but the content of this film, basically there's every sin under the sun in this movie. So I've argued why it should be considered film noir. This gown is probably the most influential in the movie. It does show still the legacy of 1930s style. The lace and the volume of that skirt, which is light pink, by the way, would not be possible during the war years. And we'll touch upon why that is so. But this gown, you will see having influence in fashion today. But the reason that these opening movies, the before the war movies are so interesting is because you do see the transition into 1940s style. And so many of her costumes show the much leaner silhouette of the 1940s. And then I just wanted to show one picture with Una Munson who's playing Madame Ginsling in this movie. Those are the costumes by Royer who of course I cover in the book as well. So here's some of the cinema connection I mentioned that I include in the online series. Now Cassini, even in his autobiography, loved to complain that nobody talked about his costumes in this movie Nobody complimented him for the costumes in this movie, and that could not be further from the truth. The studio used them in pre-promotion for the movie, and then after the movie came out, it appeared in the movie magazines and fashion magazines into the year. Jean Tierney continued to talk about the style and how excited she was by it. Sometimes the universe gives me a gift. And this year <laughs> came this gown uh, by Givenchy for the 2020 Academy Awards. This is the Shanghai Gesture Gown. It's even styled like the Shanghai Gesture Gown. She's got the updo, she's got the choker necklace, the skirt is voluminous and pink. This is it to perfection. So thank you from the gods. But this look has been growing in popularity in fashion over the years. Most recently, in the past couple of years in fashion, we've seen a lot of what I would call these illusion gowns, where there's a lot of sheer and then strategically placed lace or sequins. Um, but this look from this movie is very on trend right now. All right. So the war years, of course, the historical context is the war itself. And one of the biggest impact on the home front and on fashion 
is the fact that there was rationing. And I'm always surprised at how few people recognize that this was going on and how big of an impact it had on the style of the 1940s. So everything was rationed, the types of fabric, the amount of fabric, um, things that could, the embellishments were limited. Everything was controlled by limitation order 85. Uh, and so the streamlined silhouette, think of the pencil skirt. You could not have a piece of clothing that is more economical as far as fabric use. That is an example of how this impacted fashion and costume design at the time. And of course, women's worlds completely changed during the war. It went from men still trying to keep women out of the workforce to them growing to almost beg them and appeal to their patriotism to get into the workforce. They were needed that badly. During the war, women made up over a third of the workforce and they were doing everything. Um, and so this is a big shift, this independence, this dominance in the workforce. You see a little bit of that tension reflected in film noir. So this period has every single one of these is a rock solid noir. There is no debate about any of these six films. So first we have To Have and Have Not, costumes by Milo Anderson, who is number two at Warner Brothers. This is the movie where Bogart and Bacall met. It's her first picture, a 19-year-old Bacall, and this is one of the most influential films on fashion, largely because of that gingham suit. Double Indemnity, Femme Fatale, this is no intragon, costumes by Edith Head. She worked and was friends with director Billy Wilder and Barbara Stanwyck and was hugely responsible for Barbara Stanwyck finally being seen as a beautiful woman in Hollywood. So there are great stories about this film in the book. Laura, few movies capture the concept of fashion in film better than Laura. Costumes by Bonnie Cashin, who came from the fashion industry, a giant, hugely influential on fashion designers today, but she also worked as a costume designer. This is a cavalcade of haute couture for Jean Tierney in this movie. And Cashin even debuts her spaniel ears hat in this movie, which you can see here. Murder My Sweet, costumes by Edward Stevenson at RKO, a, another of the lesser known costume designers, but deserves to be known, and I explain why. This is Claire Te Trevor, never a bad performance from Claire Trevor. Um, she's often called the queen of film noir because of how many big roles she has in this genre. And this was a big movie for Dick Powell, who has spent years at Warner Brothers as a baby face crooner. And this was the moment where he shifted into a more tough guy leading man image. Mildred Pierce, another giant as far as being influential on fashion. Costumes by Milo Anderson, again for Warner Brothers. This is Joan Crawford's movie. She won the Oscar for it. It has quintessential Joan Crawford style in it. And it's even more fascinating because this is the movie that she did after she was ousted from her home studio of MGM. This Gun for Hire, costume design by Edith Head. Edith Head is a complete enigma. Now, I did a event at the National Arts Club with my good friend, Suze Claussen, who is here today, who embodies Edith Head. So you know a lot of her backstory already. Eight Academy Awards, 35 nominations, a complete enigma amongst costume designers then and now because she had no fashion experience whatsoever. 
basically learned on the job for, from two of the best teachers she could ask for, Howard Greer and Travis Banton, who were just these super talented couturiers. Um, but Edith became hugely influential in fashion, probably best known for her work on the Hitchcock pictures like Rear Window and To Catch a Thief. But she is also known for establishing the style of Veronica Lake. And so I love being able to share this story. This movie is the first pairing of another great on-screen film noir couple, Alan Ladd and Veronica Lake. Though her romantic lead is Robert Preston in this, and they figured out real quick that these two had great chemistry, and in the same year paired them again in The Glass Key and then The Blue Dahlia in 1946. This movie, though Edith had already helped establish her style in movies like Sullivan's Travels, this movie really shows the template for Veronica Lake's style moving forward. This dress includes all the tricks that Edith employed. Long sleeve, floor length, both to elongate her but also to hide those huge platform heels. An open neckline to keep the neck long the ruching around the bust, and then that molded torso. Everything works to stretch her out because she was only four foot 11. She was the tiniest actress, tiniest adult, Edith said, that she had ever worked with. And even when she's wearing dresses like this keyhole dress, she's still employing a lot of the same tricks to elongate her. You can see it in the open neck, the molded bodice, and even her skirts on her dresses are just a little bit longer. It should be noted that I discuss Alan Ladd's style as well, and he has a lot of the same tricks. You'll notice that his trench coats are a little bit longer than everybody. His sleeves are a little bit longer because he was only five foot six. So it's one of the reasons that they were such a great on-screen couple visually as well as the chemistry. And then monochromatic, keeping things, we've all learned this from fashion, keep things in the same color family and it helps make you seem leaner and taller. In addition, even her hats. So at the time, if you think of Casablanca, Ingrid Bergman's horizontal brim hat, or Betty Davis in Now Voyager, her horizontal brim hat, Veronica's have vertical detail. And that's, again, to make her seem taller on screen. The cinema connections are vast, so I have tried to edit it down here as best I could. Um, again, this movie is really what started out her style. And so you can see in the same year The Glass Key came out and how many of those components are also included in this robe. And then her style appears in other influential costume designs, such as this in LA Confidential. This dress by Armani, though it doesn't have the overt signs of the Edith head gown, it is more minimal in its treatment, but it is still composing itself with a lot of the lessons learned from Veronica Lake's style. And then this dress I just found on Nordstrom right now, the ruching around the bust, the open neckline, the molded bodice, the length, it's all Veronica Lake style. This dress I wanted to share with you the original. This is what Veronica wore in the movie, courtesy of my friend Randall Throp, who's the archivist at Paramount and is responsible for saving many a costume. Um, but this gives you a better sense of what it looks like in person. And it was immediately influential. Um, certainly here's some uh, patterns that were happening because more women were making their clothes than ever before during the war years. But we can see it manifest on the fashion runways as well. And then this costume from Nocturnal Animals also is including a lot of the elements of Veronica Lake. 
And then like a few women in this book, Veronica's hair is a story all its own. And I do get into all the details of her hair. Um, I mean, she's incredible because so many people know her name, know that hairstyle, but have never seen a Veronica Lake movie, which I hope they, they change that quickly. But I mean, how many red carpets do we see that have Veronica Lake style? I mean, there's not an actress who hasn't woven this into her, her style wardrobe in some way, shape or form. All right. The year of transition, 1946, really does have its own personality because this was the year of homecoming. 1.5 mil million people came back in December 45 and then just massive discharges day after day after day through 1946. So this had great ramifications for box office because Hollywood experienced like its peak year in 1946. But women, think of that through line, that story. Uh, so women were losing their jobs at three times the rate of men. So some of that is coming into play at this time. But in film noir, so People often say 1939 is the greatest year in film history because of Gone with the Wind, The Wizard of Oz, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I say 1946 is the greatest year in film noir history. It's certainly the zenith of film noir style. I mean, look at the selection we have. And there are more from 1946. I'm only covering five of them. Gilda. First and foremost, her strapless put the blame on Mame Gown from costume designer Jean-Louis at Columbia is one of the most influential costumes of all time. There are countless red carpet dresses that owe something to that gown. It is all over the place. And this movie is just a cavalcade of aspirational style. And it's really what turned Rita Hayworth into a global superstar. The Big Sleep also came out in 1946. Bogart and Bacall again. This really solidified Bogart Bacall style. This time costumes by Leah Rhodes, who would also do their costumes in Key Largo. The Postman Always Rings Twice, another from 1946. Costumes by Irene, head costume designer at that time at MGM. And what's notable about this, well, there's many things, but one is that it's MGM. So MGM was known for family movies like the Andy Hardy movies and glitzy, glamorous musicals. So it's a sign of the times that even MGM is getting into the noir game. And what's significant about this film is that the bulk of her wardrobe is white. There's only two costumes in it that are black. And so that's a story unto itself. Now we have Notorious. Notorious is debated. Is it noir or is it not noir? One of the reasons for this is that it's Alfred Hitchcock. And Alfred Hitchcock is sort of a genre unto himself. He has an immediately identifiable style. But I make the case for why it should be considered noir, not the least of which that it almost has an identical storyline to Gilda. Um, but primarily because of the relationship between Cary Grant and Ingrid Bergman. Like Gilda, it's this love-hate, mostly hate <laughs> relationship. Uh, and that kind of tension is just quintessential noir. And I had to share a little bit more of the killers, of course. I mean, she's on the cover of the book. Again, Robert C. Odmack, who came from UFA, Costume design by Vera West. Vera is also one of the lesser known costume designers of the golden age of Hollywood, but it's so odd because she was head of costume design at Universal 
for longer than her contemporaries, Adrian was at MGM and Travis Banton was at Paramount. And she too came from the world of couture. But Universal was best known for the horror movies. And so she, Vera, became the queen of horror couture. Um, but she started her own couturier after she left Universal. What makes her story so perfect for this book is that she committed suicide in June 1947, which was just on the heels of her opening her new business and on the heels of her leaving Universal. And there's a lot of questionable circumstances surrounding this suicide. So it's like she could not be a better film noir costume designer if she tried. The Killers is one of my favorite film noir. It opens with that gorgeous cinematography right from the get-go. And this gown is the signature of the movie. There are a few of these movies where the gown, a gown, is used in a lot of the promotional material. Well, this one, like Elizabeth Scott in Dead Reckoning, was everywhere. And it's part of what got people into the theaters and excited to see it. Though, Ava had been at MGM for years. She had been underused and misused. And it really was this movie that kicked her into the stratosphere. What's amazing about The Killers is it's a great uh, war years and we're in 46. So obviously it was made right on the edge of that because it contains aspirational style but also the kind of style that the average movie going woman was used to. So two of Ava's costumes are just these blouse and skirts. And then she also wears a sweater and skirt. So Ava is one of the sweater girls of the 1940s. And you can see how lethal she is as Kitty Collins. I mean, she doesn't even have shoes on in the bed and you can tell exactly what's on her mind. And we get a great dress that's this sweetheart neckline, which is one of the, the looks of the 1940s. Uh, please note that the stolen jewelry that she's wearing is even in the shape of a spider. So she's literally a black widow. And then also interesting is that one of her costumes is a trench coat. Now we all know that trench coats are, are, are quintessential men's style in film noir. So it's really notable when one of the women wears one because it signifies certainly strength as with her and then also just that mystery around her. The Cinema Connection, this is one of the most influential gowns of all time, like the Gilda gown. There are a ton of red carpets that have some incarnation of the Gilda gown. In fact, the whole look of Ava Gardner. The Sweetheart neckline, you can see it in patterns. I mean, Ava Gardner was one of the best models of 1940s style. So even though others wore the Sweetheart neckline, she accelerated its popularity and we can still see it in anything retro today. And the trench coat. So for example, costume design for Kerry Washington in Scandal. Again, it shows a little bit of mystery, but also strength, which were two parts of her character in that TV series. And Burberry, Burberry was responsible for the original trench coats for men in World's War, World Wars I and II. And in the last decade or so, it started to be a trend with women. Um, and now it's just a basic in everybody's wardrobe. And so Burberry has annual campaigns promoting the trench coats for women. And finally, the post-war years, 47 to 50. The backdrop of this time period is very different than the other. So we went from fighting a world abroad to fighting a war at home. And it's, I, I tell a little bit of the story of how insane it was that we just beat fascism abroad and promoted ourselves as the land of the free and that we had pride in civil rights. And then they come home and we have the blacklist. 
Um, so that definitely had uh, an influence in film noir, certainly the tone and the alienation, it just added to it. So fashion seemed to swoop in and give a little morale booster. After years of deprivation, women finally had something uh, to aspire to. Christian Dior's La Corelle collection came out in February 47 otherwise known, better known as the new look. And you can see the shifts in the, the volume of the skirt, the longer skirts, the, the less sharp shoulder line, the nipped in waist. Um, but this came on the heels of rationing restrictions only ended at the end of 46. So there was quite a bit of protest about that this was unpatriotic. In fact, in Britain, all of rationing had not been lifted. Corsets, which were mandatory for the new look, were still being rationed. So it really came at an interesting uh, period of time. And Dior, in addition to discussing his design, uh, tried to convince people that he brought back the art of pleasing. So now women got smacked back into their homes, whether they liked it or not. And I share statistics that most women did not want to go back to being homemakers, even married women who everyone assumed wanted to be back home. They wanted to stay working too. So we went from working a little bit to doing everything under the sun and being completely independent to go back at home. Um, and so it threw us right back to the turn of the century as far as attitude and style because now we were back in corsets again. So there's six pictures uh, from, 19, uh, from this time period that I cover. First is Dead Reckoning, uh, costumes by Jean-Louis once again who did them for Gilda. Uh, this is Elizabeth Scott in her first femme fatale role. She had been in the strange, Lo the strange Loves of Martha Ivers in 1946, but she wasn't a femme fatale in this. So this is her big, um, you know, starring role. In fact, she was given almost equal billing and promotion to her co-star Humphrey Bogart, who just continues, you know, being the style icon in this film. Lady in the Lake, costumes by Irene once again. What's unique about this movie, not the least of which that it's, it's set during the holidays. So <laughs> MGM's even using Phil Noir to say happy holidays in 1947. Uh, but this film is shot entirely from the standpoint of the lead, Robert Montgomery, who's playing Detective Philip Marlowe. So his co-star, Audrey Totter, who also does not give a bad performance ever, uh, is front and center through most of the picture. And these are quintessential 1940s style from Irene. She loved this time period. She was known for the cut and the form and the fit of her costumes. And this movie came out mere days before the new look debuted. So it's really an interesting line of demarcation between the eras of style. Out of the Past, 1948, one of my favorite film noir, costumes by Edward Stevenson uh, for Jane Greer and Robert Mitchum. This movie's really interesting because the costumes are so different. The first part of the movie, she's a good girl and the costumes reflect that. And the second part of the movie, we find out what Kathy Moffat really is and her costumes reflect that as well. So it's, import it's an important part of character and that evolution. Next, The Lady from Shanghai, costumes by Jean-Louis again for his friend Rita Hayworth. One of the big stories of this movie also has to do with the hair because she was known for that long flowing red hair of hers. And so I discussed the controversy and the process of cutting her hair, um, what style they settled on, the color they settled on. It's really interesting. 
Sunset Boulevard costumes by Edith Head. Edith is mentioned most in this book. She's mentioned four times. This was an important picture for her um, and her friend, director Billy Wilder. She got to work with her idol. So Edith started Paramount in the early 1920s when Gloria Swanson was the superstar. So this was just an amazing experience for Edith. And she also just shows what a master she is at design, sort of proving everyone uh, you know, wrong as far as like, is she a good designer? She's a good designer because she's marrying early 1920s style with a little bit of 40s style and then 50s style as well. And last, The Asphalt Jungle, uh, directed by John Houston, who also did The Maltese Falcon, costume design by Helen Rose, MGM again. So not only is MGM an unlikely studio for film noir, Helen Rose is the least likely costume designer for film noir. In contrast to Irene, who preceded her as head of costume design at MGM, Helen loved color loved extravagant musicals, was known for her chiffon dresses. Um, and she was known for, you know, a lot of Elizabeth Taylor's costumes. So Cat on a Hot Tin Roof, Butterfield 8. She was also known for wedding dresses, uh, Elizabeth Taylor's first wedding dress, Grace Kelly's wedding dress, which has been hugely influential, um, including for Kate Middleton. And her story is also really interesting because she started her career as a teenager designing for burlesque shows in mob run 1920s Chicago. So she should know a little something about noir. And the asphalt jungle is almost entirely men except for a couple of women, one of them being Marilyn Monroe. And Marilyn had been struggling for years, even when she was doing movies like Lady of the Chorus, she really wasn't getting the traction. I mean, we're so used to her being an icon, um, but she was not at the time. This was a moment of desperation. She got the role, she had small parts in it, but she made the most of them. She is absolutely excellent in this. So this is the moment we meet her character, Angela, looking just as feminine as can be. Uh, but this is the gown that the movie is known for. And there's countless poses of her in this dress. And what's interesting is that Helen tried to put her in Lana Turner's kind of style. You can even see her hair is styled like that. She literally put her in a suit of Lana's because at the time they had the same measurements, but it just looked wrong. And so the, one of the things that she found is that Marilyn actually looked better in like a towel than in a full structured ensemble, which Travila would change later. But for now, that's the attitude. So you can see that there's construction, but there's just that little bit off the shoulder casual look about it. And that became the basis of a lot of Marilyn's early style. So her, one of her favorite fashion designers was Seal Chapman and this iconic moment on Life magazine on the cover of Life. This uh, dress by Ole Cassini was originally designed for his wife, Jean Tierney. Marilyn borrowed it for the monkey business premiere still tapping into the structure, but off the shoulder kind of look. And then Dorothy Jeekins, who designed her costumes in Niagara in this iconic hot pink dress, also is using some of those design elements. And one of the things that I tried to point out is how much film noir uh, gave Marilyn this fo early foundation in film before she became a big star right after this in Gentlemen Prefer Blondes. So that's it for today. One giant teaser, I know. Uh, again, book and online series goes into so much more. 
Um, and so on that note, my first film noir style event is on Before the War. It is Sunday, October 18th at four, the same time. And if you want to look into that event or stay in touch with me, my website is glamamore.com. And I am at glamamore on basically every social media platform under the sun. So I am regularly uh, promoting the events and keeping you all in the loop on those and the book as well. Um, so I hope you, I hope I find some new friends from today's event. So thank you very much. <laughs> thank you, Kimberly. These images are so stunning. And thank you for all of these beautiful photos and the great presentation. Um, you know, one of the, you know, questions I have right now is, um, why do you think that the fashion from this genre has so much resonance with us today? What of this style are we relating to? Well, I think it's a couple things. One is that um, I think women are entranced with the whole femme fatale, <laughs> you know, and this era had very strong women and not that every era doesn't have strong women in it, but they are consistently strong in film noir, even after the advent of the new look, uh, women continue to go toe to toe with the men. And there are so many pieces in 1940s film noir, you know, career wear alone, like all the suiting. Um, and because it's, it's accessible, you know, it's not like the 1930s, uh, if you think of like the Letty Linton dress for Joan Crawford, that's over the top, you know, where, where are you wearing that except for the Oscars red carpet? Whereas so many of the pieces in film noir, even the more glamorous ones seem like you could incorporate them still today. That makes sense. And you know, what's so remarkable about your presentation and your book is the focus on um, the talents of these costume designers, but also the contributions of, of other artists like screenwriters, cinematographers, directors, who are all involved in creating the looks and stories in this genre. Um, we have a great question from the audience, which is during the production, who dictated the look? Was it the designer? Was it the director or the producer? And how did those decisions get made? made? Uh, it's, that's, it's complicated. Um, there's a lot of studio politics. Uh, it kind of depended who was a stronger entity, the director or the producer, or even the studio head, to be honest. Um, costumes had to work with the director's vision, the production designer's vision, all costumes had to be approved by those various entities, often up to the studio heads, sometimes the studio heads' wives. And then the production code ad administration had to approve costumes and the photo tests um, to make sure that they weren't too revealing, particularly for characters like the femme fatales, because they almost had stricter guidelines. Um, Jean Tierney's costumes in Lever to Heaven, for example, there are a ton of memos about that. And that's about as conservative a wardrobe as I can think of. But because she was such a bad character, they were really reining back on being too revealing. Um, so, you know, it's kind of everyone had a say. <laughs> well, what is one movie that you would have liked to have included in this book, but didn't make the cut? Well, I mean, there's, there's a lot from uh, 1946. So the Blue Dahlia is in there, the Strange Love of Martha Ivers is in there, and that has two, di Barbara Stanwyck's wardrobe and Elizabeth Scott's wardrobe. Um, I mean, there's just, there's a lot. And I had to, I'm sort of like working from a starting point. I wanted to make sure that there was some degree of familiarity with these films. Uh, while also being able to perhaps introduce a few others. Um, we have this really great question from the audience. How is film noir style, film noir style different from regular Hollywood glamour of the same period? For instance, how is Veronica Lake dressed differently in Sullivan's Travel, for, uh, as an example? 
Um, she's not really. I mean, for the most part, not, film noir is, um, it's along the lines of 1940s style, although film noir, they tended to be smaller budget pictures. So they weren't these big musical extravaganzas, for example, that might still be going on in the 1940s. So, I mean, that means it's a smaller budget for the costumes as well. So costume designers, they still wanted to give something to aspire to. Um, but as far as, you know, the difference between the styles of uh, Sullivan's Travels and This Gun for Hire, there's, there's not that much in, in her style. Um, but, you know, like I Married a Witch, she has a little bit more frill to her. So you're not getting, and some of that has to do with because we hadn't hit the war yet. Um, but, you know, everything, it, film noir is a very serious genre, you know, there's joking in it, but people are getting killed. So, <laughs> you know, that that's kind of the difference. The tone of the costumes tend to be different than other pictures of the 40s. Let's talk about that beautiful book cover. Um, we want it we wanted to know who the other runner-ups were for the cover and how you came to decide um, to use Rita. To use Ava. Ava, Ava, my, I am sorry. Yes. Ava. Well, your Freudian slip is one of the runners-up. I <laughs> mean, Gilda, Gilda, I think, was one of the first that I asserted. There are many great images of her in the various strapless dresses from that film. Um, but, uh, one of the reasons that, you know, sometimes there's just technical reasons what, what looks better with, you know, thing, you know, the font being put on it. Um, but also, uh, Postman always rings twice her, her opening outfit in the shorts and turban. Um, Lana Turner, that was a, a runner up as well. Um, but I wanted, I definitely wanted the hair because the style of the hair shifts so dramatically from the 30s, which tends to be shorter and tighter um, versus in film noir, they tend to have longer, looser. So I ideally wanted the image to include that. And I wanted a knockout costume on the cover. And Ava, that's a femme fatale. You know, I mean, she's just, that's noir right there. That whole shot, the cinematography, everything is it. it yeah, it's a gorgeous image. That's a, it's a beautiful cover. Um, most noir films are in black and white. And how did that translate to recreating noir style in real life? Um, you know, one of the things is, you know, thinking about color of costumes and how that impacts the, the film when it's in black and white. Um, I'm not quite sure what, what answer the person is looking for with, so mostly, uh, the costumes are in color, even when they're shooting in black and white. Um, the postman always rings twice as an exception to that rule. Um, and also notorious is also a black and white palette. Um, on purpose. But for the most part, costumes in black and white film are in color and they're chosen with how they photograph in black and white. So that became a skill set that the costume designers of this time period really had to become good at and working with the cinematographer to make sure that you know everything that the vision manifested on screen in black and white how they see it um so it's always interesting it's not like there are a ton of records or existing costumes to let us know what those costumes actually were um you know like the uh, Fred Astaire, Ginger Rogers movie, Top Hat, her feathers gown is a light blue. Um, so it's always interesting to find, you know, these little nuggets of information, but it's often very difficult to find that information. You know, many of the leading men wore their own wardrobes in the golden age. Hmm. Did any of the leading women wear their own clothing as well? No. 
<laughs> it's funny because, you know, in the modeling industry, it's sort of the women are, are king, <laughs> you know, that they're the ones that get the resources. And in the movies, I mean, this is one of my beefs with people who study film that don't give respect to the costume design because um, not only is it just another art form that's contributing to the style of these movies, but those costumes were getting people into the theaters and getting them to come back again and again and again. Um, so there's a lot of thought gone into this. And so, I mean, every once in a while, like Gwen Wakeling really liked designing for, she had Tyrone Power at 20th Century Fox and she loved working with him. Um, and Edith worked with Cary Grant on a number of pictures, but Cary had his own tailors at various points. And so Edith had to work with his vision for himself and himself on screen. Um, so it was a very different, um, very different for women on screen than the men. Can you talk a little bit about the impact of film noir on men's fashion? Oh yeah, and, and I do actually get into a, a lot of that in the book, more than you might think. So I do talk about Cary Grant's style. I talk about Alan Ladd's. I talk about uh, Glenn Ford's in Gilda. Um, and of course, Bogart. Bogart is just like a, a giant in men's style today. Um, and so, you know, it, it's interesting because we, in men's style, we swung from like the double breasted suits of the 1930s to the, you know, the single button because, or, you know, not double breasted because of the amount of fabric that was being used. Um, and so these guys were just these perfect, tough role models for men during this era. And so, of course, that's going to inspire you to, to dress like them and continue to dress like them. <laughs> Speaking of which, outside of Bogart, which performers would bring their own style to their noir characters? Uh, and conversely, who adopted their screen, um, their, their on-screen look, off stage? Um, well, I mean, one of the things that I really praise Bogart for uh, is, you know, when he played Sam Spade in the Maltese Falcon, in the book, the character looks absolutely nothing like Bogart. I mean, he's even blonde in the book. And so, not only, as I say in the book, not only did Bogart become Sam Spade, but Sam Spade became Humphrey Bogart. And so that persona then also became Philip Marlowe in The Big Sleep and also became Rip Murdoch in Dead Reckoning and also became Rick in Casablanca. So he had enormous, like he had just reached the perfect point in his life where he knew who he was off screen and on screen. And he brought all of that to the characters in the 1940s. And it's that authenticity that I think a lot of men and women uh, still respond to because this is a rather inauthentic world at times. So it's nice to see someone just being themselves. And again, Cary Grant. Cary Grant was in total control over his style. So again, like he definitely made more effort, I would say. Like he was really into the details and had suits cut a certain way so that um, he was sensitive about his neck. Um, and so just the cut of everything was just so to make him look leaner and taller. Um, so those two, I think, were in the most control over their looks on screen. And then the others, I mean, it's sort of like the genre itself was shaping this image, particularly with those trench coats. And there wasn't a lot of variety during the Warriors as far as what they could do with suits. So there's a lot of chalk stripe suits. There's a lot of solid suits. Um, but I mean, they look terrific in them. 
We are curious about you, Kimberly. Um, so what decade, oh God. <laughs> what decade do you emulate in your own style of dress? Um, and what, um, what is maybe one of your favorite designers to, to, to wear today? Uh, designers are cost, you're saying like modern designers who would I wear? Okay. Um, so there's a lot of you here that know <laughs> my style. Now today I am 1940s. I've got my homage to Veronica Lake with a little bit of a keyhole happening. Um, but I primarily style myself in the late 50s, early 60s, like uh, there's not a sheath dress that I don't love. I just love the, the tailoring of it. Um, and then also some of the 70s style because it, it, there are actually minimalist pieces. I'm, I'm a minimalist. I like primarily solids. I like things that are tailored to the body. Um, but if I was going out, for like a big evening, 1930s bias cut gowns, love. And then any, you know, 70s interpretation of 30s bias cut gowns, a la Halston or something like that, love. But I'm at heart very much a minimalist and I'm not a frilly uh, type of person. So like Edith had, as people know, Edith had and Rear Window, is kind of where I started my really studying costume design, not only for film history, but also for just helping define my own personal style. So her minimalist tailored approach is, is what I respond to. Uh, as far as modern designers, you know, anyone who's got the, the minimalist aesthetic, Michael Kors used to have it, Jason Wu, um, but again, I don't like a lot of frills. Um, I don't even like a lot of jewelry. I'm just, I'm a tomboy. I know people have a hard time believing that, but it is true. Um, so I like, I like it. I like to keep it simple. <laughs> I love learning that about you. And speaking of Edith Head, and, and you know, you did that wonderful program that we hosted with Susan Klassen on Edith Head. We had a question, which was, um, did Edith Head use browns for blacks because it showed better on film? Um, because it showed better, I mean, she used them. Um, Hitchcock's palette was nature colors. So he liked, the, that's one of the reasons he likes green. So that, that green appears in Rear Window and the birds, for example. Um, she used browns, um, but I, I wouldn't say that she used them all that often for the lead. Um, Marnie, she wears, like when she's trying to stay undercover, she's using the browns, but it's not going to be on the, the lead that, you know, that people are supposed to be paying attention to. Now, Tippi Hedren opened the birds in a black marled suit. Um, so it does happen, but um, one of the reasons I love her and Helen Rose and Jean-Louis is because they love color. So I do love the power of color, um, but I like it in a minimal silhouette. That's amazing. So, you know, well, now I'm very inspired to go see a classic movie. Um, and for <laughs> those who want to see one right now, can you recommend a favorite movie in that film noir genre and tell us why you love it? Um, I think, I mean, it, it kind of depends who you like. I mean, I, I started as a kid with the Bogart films. So my dad was a police officer. And so he would come home in the middle of the night and watch Maltese Falcon or The Big Sleep. So those were my actual starting points. Uh, but I would also recommend something like Gilda uh, because from a style standpoint, there's always something to look at and she's just such a prominent figure in it and the chemistry between her and Glenn Ford is off the charts. So there's my answer. <laughs> That's, those are wonderful recommendations. I'm, I'm definitely gonna have that queued up to watch. Thank you for joining us today for this amazing uh, presentation with all of these wonderful, beautiful pictures. 
Uh, Kimberly Truler, it's been an honor to have you with us. And I want to remind our audience, if you're interested in Kimberly's book, the link to pre-order the physical book is in the chat box. Um, the link to order today, the um, ebook, uh, is also in the chat box. Um, and the, the physical book will be shipped to you in December. If you are interested in other programs presented by the National Arts Club, you can visit our YouTube channel. You can also go to nationalartsclub.org. I am Angela Louie, and thank you for joining us. Thank you so much.